thank you so much uh, for the invitation uh, to present this work. And thanks to Dom for a really great uh, intro and kind of set up into this second half uh, of the webinar. Um, so my lab is really interested in microbial cell biology and microbial physiology. And as Dom pointed out, um, there have been a number of papers over the last uh, decade or so that have shown that sphingolipids play a really important role in uh, host uh, microbial interactions uh, for bacteria like sphingomonas. Um, the sphingolipids play an important role in giving structure to the outer membrane. And so we're really interested in understanding the underlying biology. And a major challenge, as Dom pointed out, is that we don't understand the full mechanism of sphingolipid synthesis in bacteria, right? And so this is in contrast to the eukaryotic system, right, where there's been a tremendous amount of work to identify all of the enzymes, to do some really great biochemistry. And, and we have, you know, a pretty detailed understanding of how sphingolipid synthesis works in eukaryotes. But what about in bacteria, right? So as Dom just pointed out, the first uh, enzyme that, that does the first committed step, the serine polymatoyl transferase, that's conserved in bacteria. And that's how Don was able to identify it in, in sphingomonas and do the, the uh, crystal structures. But what about the rest of the pathway, right? So if you were to take the human um, KDSR, the ketosphingine reductase, and do a blast against bacteria, you wouldn't find any obvious homologs. And the same thing goes with the ceramide synthase. So where are these enzymes? And so we considered two possibilities when thinking about potential mechanism. One is that bacteria, in fact, do very similar chemistry. It's just that the enzymes diverged so long ago evolutionarily that the similarity between them is so low that if you were to just do a simple blast, you wouldn't find it. And possibility number two is that bacteria just do something totally different, and we don't know what that is. So in order to tell you how we went about uh, studying this, I have to take a step back and kind of explain where this whole project came from, because I was not, and I still would say am not, uh, really a lipid uh, biologist, although I'm learning a lot as we go, right? My lab is really interested in bacterial cell shape, right? So bacteria come in every conceivable uh, shape and size, and shape is really important for their function. And that's what we were really trying to get at is, is how cells regulate their shape. And we study, um, our model organism is this guy over here, letter M, this is uh, Colobacter crescentis. And we study it because uh, it's asymmetric and it grows this polar uh, stalk appendage. And not only does it grow a stalk appendage, but the length of that stalk is regulated by uh, the availability of phosphate in the environment. So here you can see Colobacter grown in one millimolar phosphate and has a fairly short stalk. And then as you go to one micromolar or down to nanomolar phosphate, the stalk and the cell body get much, much longer. And so we were doing some mechanistic studies to try to understand what are the enzymes involved in, in regulating cell shape. And I gave a talk, um, it's uh, probably about seven, eight years ago, at the University of Pennsylvania. And I was describing this project and we were talking about how the outer membrane of Colobacter crescentis, which is a gram negative organism, has this, uh, the outer membrane is asymmetric and it has lipopolysaccharide decorating the outer leaflet and, and phospholipids uh, on the inner leaflet. And in the audience is somebody that many of you probably know, Howard Goldfein. And uh, a day or two after the talk, I get an email from him saying, oh, you know, that was really interesting. And you get this uh, stock elongation. And I mentioned that, you know, if you do a back of the envelope calculation, the total surface area of the cell increases about six to seven fold, right? And he asked what was such an obvious question that it still kind of is remarkable to me that no one had asked this question before which is, well, you're doing this in a situation where there's very, very limited phosphate. So you're not making phospholipids. So how do you make all that membrane? What, what kind of lipid is it that can account for all this increase in surface area? And so we did the experiment, right? So we took uh, colobacter grown in high phosphate, and this is with uh, help of our amazing collaborator, Zikwang Guan, who's at Duke University. And so he did the lipid uh, MS, and what you can see is that in colobacter, there's one dominant phospholipid, uh, phosphatidylglycerol, as well as some diacylglycerol lipids. And this actually matched very nicely to uh, initial characterization from 1980. 
And then we took those same cells and grew them in low phosphate. So here we're talking one micromolar phosphate. And as expected, the PG essentially disappears because there's very little phosphate to make it. And we see the appearance of this new peak. And he solved the, uh, the structure of that, that lipid. And it turns out to be a glycosphingolipid, which was really exciting for us because it, as Dom pointed out, right, even though we know some examples of bacterial sphingolipids, you know, in, in essentially every single paper on bacterial sphingolipids in the introductory section will have some sentence that says something like these extremely rare lipids, right? It's a, it's a small handful of bacteria that, that can make such things, right? So we were really excited uh, to see this lipid and to try to understand what is it doing in colobacter. And uh, to piggyback off Dom, right? So we know that SPT is the enzyme that carries out the first step. And it turns out that colobacter has three um, enzymes that look like they could be um, SPT enzymes, one of which is essential. So we couldn't work on that. But for the other two, we knocked them out and looked at the formation of ceramide by LCMS. And it turns out that this gene here, the CCNA1220, is the, the colobacter SPT. So you delete this gene and the ceramide completely goes away and we can complement it. We can put back in this gene and restore ceramide production. And so this was a convenient tool now, right? We can use this mutant to study the physiology of uh, bacterial ceramides in colobacter. And so, um, you know, as Don mentioned, we, we published this work and then uh, Don reached out and, and that was the beginning of a really fantastic collaboration. So we sent him over the, the colobacter enzyme and, and they were able to purify it and show biochemically that it in fact is a, a true uh, serine palmitoyl transferase. So what does it do in colobacter, right? Colobacter is a freshwater aquatic bacterium. It's not pathogenic. Um, it doesn't associate with an animal host as, as far as we know. So like in the context of, of bacteroides and porphyromonas, where it's important in regulating host immune function, that doesn't seem to be the case for colobacter. So what does it do? So we knocked out this SPT and um, we're hoping to look for some kind of phenotype. And as often as the case, uh, we, we had a really hard time. So you knock out this gene, the bacteria grow perfectly fine. They actually elongate stalks perfectly fine. There was no obvious phenotype until we started challenging it with certain molecules. And so one of the first things that we did was challenged it with a, an antibiotic called polymyxin B. So this is one of the cationic antimicrobial peptides and it interacts with the outer membrane. And we know in sphingomonas where uh, glycosphingolipids take the place of lipopolysaccharide on the outer membrane, we assumed that in colobacter, these lipids are on the outer membrane as well. But the result that we got was exactly the opposite of our prediction. So there was a phenotype. So if you look at wild type in blue here, right, uh, untreated, they grow very nicely. When you hit the wild type bacteria with polymyxin, they die. If you knock out SPT, they grow perfectly fine. But now if you take the knockout and hit them with polymyxin, they actually grow perfectly fine as well. So by removing um, sphingolipids, the bacteria actually become resistant uh, to polymyxin antibiotics which was a little bit surprising, but an interesting phenotype. In the wild, presumably colobacter is not encountering a whole lot of polymyxin B. So while this is an interesting phenotype, we were really trying to figure out what is it doing in its natural environment. And so we then turned to challenge with phage. So this is a particular colobacter uh, bacteriophage called CR30, and it interacts with this uh, so-called surface layer. So this is a proteinaceous layer that, that sits on top of the outer membrane. And here, when we get rid of the sphingolipids by deleting SPT, the cells become more sensitive to phage. And we were able to show that that's because of increased binding. So when you remove the sphingolipids, the phage are able to bind better to the bacterial surface and induce killing. And so my lab is actively working on trying to understand the phenotypes for the phage. We're still in the very early stages, uh, but with the polymyxin at the very end of the talk, I'll give you a little bit into, of insight into why we uh, believe um, removing sphingolipids actually increases resistance to polymyxin. But for this talk, um, these physiological properties are actually what, what were the springboard for trying to understand the mechanism of bacterial sphingolipid synthesis. 
And so one of the powers of working in bacteria is that we can do really large scale genetic screens. And here we have two phenotypes, right? So if we get rid of SPT, the bacteria become resistant to polymyxin and they become sensitive to phage. And so we were able to set up a genetic screen where we take a population of, of colobacter, we mutagenize them using transposon mutagenesis. So here we're randomly inserting transposons all over the genome, right? And then we can take those mutants and plate them on agar containing polymyxin B. And so bacteria that can't make sphingolipids are presumably going to be resistant to polymyxin. So we get colonies. And then we take those individual colonies and grow them in duplicate, plus or minus phage, right? And so any um, bacteria that don't make sphingolipids presumably become more uh, susceptible to phage. And so we take those wells that can't grow in phage, take the corresponding ones that were untreated, and then do LCMS to look at uh, sphingolipids, right? So this was our screen to look for potential other enzymes in this synthetic pathway. And when we did this screen, we got a number of transposon hits, one of which, uh, or several of which were in the SPT gene. So that makes perfect sense um, and confirms uh, the, the validity of the, the general approach. But we also got hits in nearby genes and we wanted to figure out what they were. So as Don pointed out in Sphingomonas, immediately um, next to the SPT is an acyl carrier protein and colobacter is the same. So there's an ACP here. And then um, a couple of genes down is an ACP synthetase. And so our first uh, step was to knock out these genes and ask what happens to sphingolipid synthesis. And so if you knock out the ACP, you completely lose ceramides, you can complement it back and, and regain ceramide synthesis. And similarly, you can knock out the synthetase, lose ceramides and complement that back. So again, uh, a nice proof of concept, you know, we were fairly confident that that was gonna work. Um, but what about these other neighboring genes? So in the eukaryotic pathway, right, the second step is this reduction, right? Reduction of the ketone to the alcohol over here. And one of these hits, this gene 1222, is annotated as an NADH ubiquinone reductase. And we said, well, you know, it has the word reductase in the title, and this has the word reductase in the title. So let's delete that gene and see what happens. And so here's uh, wild type cells where we get a ceramide of uh, mass 588 and 572. This is due to a difference in hydroxylation. And when we knock out this reductase, um, we see a mass shift of two Daltons corresponding to a change in the reduction. And we can complement that back. So it really does seem that this gene 1222 is a functional reductase. The next step in the eukaryotic pathway is the addition of the second acyl chain by a ceramide synthase. And we saw this gene down here, which in colobacter is annotated as a DATP pyrophosphohydrolase, which I still don't exactly know what that does. But if you look at homologs of this gene in other organisms, in many other organisms, it's actually annotated as a GNAT family acyl transferase. And that we thought, okay, that, that could be doing this um, acylation step. So again, we knock out the gene, um, ceramides completely go away. We can complement it and restore it. And here again, Dom's group uh, did a, a lot of the heavy lifting here. They were able to purify uh, this enzyme and show that the recombinant enzyme could take three KDS and a C16-CoA substrate and uh, add the acyl chain onto KDS. So again, now we have uh, genetic and biochemical evidence that this gene 1212 is really uh, an acyl transferase. Now, right as we were getting ready to, uh, to submit this paper, um, Otto Geiger's group uh, published this paper and identified the exact same set of five genes. So uh, on the one hand, you know, you never want to get scooped. On the other hand, it was, uh, it was nice to see confirmation that they found the identical set of genes. They used a, a purely genetic approach. And what they said was, well, you know, based on the eukaryotic pathway, they proposed this model where, um, you know, you have the SPT, you have a reductase, you have an acyl transferase, and the mechanism is going to follow along just like in uh, the eukaryotic pathway. Uh, similar actually to the pathway that Mike Fishback proposed uh, that Dom showed. But something didn't exactly look right. 
Um, and so what do I mean by that, right? So here's the eukaryotic pathway again. And if you were to go ahead and inhibit the KDSR, the reductase, you essentially just stop the, the process in its, uh, in its path right here, right? So you, you just get a, a buildup of three keto sphincter. It's not exactly what happens in bacteria, right? So uh, maybe you picked up on this. I kind of went through it fast a little bit on purpose so I could bring it up here. But what you see in bacteria is that when you knock out the reductase, right, you do lose the two Daltons, but you have a fully formed um, ceramide. It's just not reduced at this position. And we have the, the MSMS data to show that it's this position specifically that's not being reduced. So what that implies is that you can get all the way through the pathway um, with the oxidized form of the lipid. And so we thought, well, either that means that the ceramide synthase is a little bit more promiscuous, meaning that it can either use three keto sphingonine or sphingonine as a substrate. It kind of doesn't care. Um, the, it can use the oxidized or the reduced substrate, or maybe the pathway is occurring in a different order, right? So you could imagine that in eukaryotes, right? First you do the reduction, and then you add the second acyl chain to make dihydroceramide. Maybe in bacteria, you actually add the second acyl chain first and then reduce the ketone to make dihydroceramide. And so when we thought about this possibility that maybe it's occurring in a different order, one of the questions we asked is, well, where are these enzymes in the bacteria? And we were able to use this cool trick um, where you can use uh, chloroform to selectively permeabilize the outer membrane of bacteria. And so SPT, which we know is cytoplasmic, is retained in the cell when you permeabilize the membrane. The ceramide synthase is also retained when you permeabilize the membrane, but the reductase is lost, implying that it's out in the periplasmic space. So if you remove the outer membrane, this protein is now free to diffuse out and float away from the cell. And so it seems that the enzymes are spatially separated where the SPT and the CRS are in the cytoplasm and the reductase is in the periplasm. Again, supporting this idea that you can add the second acyl chain first and then do the reduction when the lipid is introduced into the periplasmic space. So then we asked, um, is this universal across other bacteria? And so one of the things that we did is we searched for homologs um, in Porphyromonas gingivalis, and we found the homologous genes, and we were able to use them to complement the deletions in Colobacter, and sure enough, they work. What we do see, though, is that the exact molecular weight of the ceramides that are produced are different, and this actually matches uh, the known preferences from Porphyromonas. So they prefer uh, longer acyl chains, for example. Um, and so we see the difference in molecular weights, but they are able to cross complement. And then we ask, well, if that's true, now that we know this complete set of genes, who else can make ceramides, right? So this is um, not a complete list, but there are, you know, the number of bacteria that were known ceramide producers was fairly small. So bioinformatically, we asked who has this full complement of genes, and it turns out that many, many gram-negative taxa have these genes. And additionally, there was one gram-positive taxa. These are some streptomyces, and we were able to get our hands on streptomyces orantiacus, and sure enough, it makes ceramide. And so this was the first gram-positive bacteria that was identified uh, to make sphingolipids. What they're doing there uh, we're not really sure. We're actually collaborating, Dom and I are collaborating with Paul Hoskison to, to ask exactly that question. Uh, so hopefully we'll have more info on that in the, in the coming years. So it seems that this is really widespread across many bacterial taxa. What they're doing there is a, a really interesting and open question. Um, we were also asked as we were doing the study and submitting this paper, you know, in, in eukaryotes, there's a lot of uh, specificity. So in humans, right, there are six different uh, ceramide synthases that have different specificities for acyl chain length. What about in bacteria? So in Colobacter, you know, we fed the recombinant ECRS different acyl chain lengths, and we can see that there is a, a preference. C14 seems to be the winner. Um, it doesn't like the really long ones. And then we asked, are there any organisms that have multiple um, ceramide synthases that could potentially have different specificities? And um, we, we used BLAST to try to find organisms that had more than one ceramide synthase. The challenge was that they were in different parts of the genome. And, and the challenge is that, you know, a lot of these acyl transferases look alike. So how do you know that they're really different 
um, that there are isoforms of, of, of ceramide synthase, but we got lucky in uh, this particular Prevotella species, Prevotella bucciae, there's actually a duplication. So there are two homologs immediately next to each other on the genome. And so we cloned them and complemented them into Colobacter. And what we could see is that they were both complemented. They were both capable of forming ceramides, but you actually see um, a two Dalton shift. And it turns out that they have different preferences for saturated versus unsaturated acyl chains, suggesting that other organisms may also have similar um, you know, multiple ceramide synthases that can give some specificity uh, into the, the particular acyl chains being used. So to finish off, um, I wanna talk about that, the, where did these enzymes come from, right? So not only uh, do we have these different enzymes, they seem to operate in a different order in bacteria. So, so where did bacteria learn to make ceramides and where did these enzymes come from? So that first step, the SPT, right? That's clearly homologous between bacteria and eukaryotes. What about the reductase, right? So here's the bacterial reductase that we call CRR for ceramide reductase. Again, it's not homologous to the eukaryotic KDSR. There's very, very, very limited uh, sequence homology. Really the only part of, of, of the proteins that are homologous is, is the actual uh, NAD binding site, but otherwise they're not homologous. But it turns out that there are homologs to the bacterial ceramide reductase in eukaryotes. They're just not related to ceramide synthesis. And the closest homolog is actually this nduf 9 a protein. This is part of um, the complex one in the mitochondria, right? And that explains why in the bacterial genome, it's annotated as an NADH ubiquinone reductase because it actually looks like this part of complex one, uh, but not related at all to the eukaryotic KDSR. And similarly for this ceramide synthase, right? It's part of this larger family of bacterial GNATs and GNAT stands for GCN5 related N-acetyltransferase. And so it's related to this eukaryotic acyltransferase family, this GCN5. So this forms one kind of uh, clade and it's totally unrelated to the eukaryotic ceramide synthase. And in fact, in eukaryotes, the ceramide synthase has this very, very conserved uh, LAG1P domain, which is completely absent from the bacterial uh, ceramide synthase. And so what this suggests is that, you know, if we take this in, in context with the fact that the, it looks like the, um, the chemical reactions occur in a different order and the enzymes are unrelated, what we're seeing here is convergent evolution of sphingolipid synthesis, that both bacteria and eukaryotes start with the same precursors and the first enzymatic step, and then do something totally different in between and end up with the same final product. And so this is really exciting, um, you know, having a handle on what the enzymes uh, are that are involved um, opens up a lot of avenues to study the physiology of these lipids in different bacterial contexts. As uh, someone asked the, the question uh, to Dom, you know, can we uh, develop new inhibitors, right? As Dom pointed out, you know, muriosin is great, uh, but it's not gonna be bacterial specific, right? We know that it'll inhibit all SPTs. But now that we know that this bacterial ceramide synthase and reductase are unique uh, and different from uh, the eukaryotic versions, there's definitely the potential to inhibit at these steps um, and identify drugs that could be bacterial specific without inhibiting eukaryotic sphingolipid metabolism. And so to finish off here, um, you know, just to set the stage for, for some other future studies, right? So here's the base um, ceramide molecule what we already know in bacteria is there's a tremendous amount of variety. Um, so in Colobacter, as I started out, we found these glycosphingolipids and that original paper, we identified the two glycosyl transferases that can put these head groups on. In Colobacter, the lipid is also has an extra hydroxyl group. So it's actually a, a, uh, a phytoceramide. And we identified the enzyme uh, that is important for putting on this head group, uh, this hydroxyl group. I mentioned earlier on that in Colobacter, when you delete um, SPT, the bacteria become resistant to polymyxin. And now we know why that is. And this paper uh, just got accepted. So keep your eyes open. It should come out in cell reports in the next month or two. So um, in that work with Kathleen Ryan, we were able to isolate a Colobacter mutant that makes no lipopolysaccharide at all. And we were trying to understand how is it able to survive 
And it turns out that in Colobacter, there's this really kind of bizarre sphingolipid. Um, so it's a ceramide with a phosphoglycerate head group, a polypholy, uh, polyphosphoglycerate head group. Um, and we identified the enzymes. It's a, it's a three enzyme sequence that puts on this, uh, this head group. And this is what actually interacts with polymyxin in, in colobacter. So when you get rid of sphingolipids, uh, the polymyxin no longer associates with the, with the colobacter uh, outer membrane. And then from work from other groups and other organisms, we know there's changes in acyl chain branching, deoxysphingolipids, changes in acyl chain length, saturation, et cetera. There's a lot left to work on um, to, to really understand what's going on in terms of bacterial physiology. And, and that's where we're hoping to head over the next number of years. And so with that, I'll, uh, I'll finish up and thank these are the, the current members of my group. Um, these are former members of the group that worked on this, but in particular, this is uh, Gabby. Gabby did just the overwhelming majority uh, of the work on um, sphingolipids in my group, and she just graduated uh, about a year ago. Um, we've been working with Zikong Wan at Duke, who's just a, a phenomenal lipid mass spectrometrist. Um, it's been a really productive and, and fun collaboration with Dom and his, his students in Edinburgh. I really have to thank Howard Goldfein, right? Had he, had he not asked that initial question of, of what lipids are there if they're not phospholipids, um, we wouldn't have gotten started on this project really at all. Um, Kathleen Ryan at Berkeley, as I just mentioned in the last slide, we've been working with her to understand the role of this uh, ceramide phosphoglycerate in, in the outer membrane structure of colobacter and work that I didn't have time to mention at all, but I just want to, to highlight. Um, Grace Brannigan is in the physics department at, at Rutgers, and uh, she's a, uh, an expert in membrane molecular dynamics simulation. So we've been doing um, some molecular dynamics to understand, again, what these lipids are doing in, in the bacterial outer membrane to get some more insight into their physiology and, and thank the funding sources, NSF and, and BBSRC. So uh, with that, I'm happy to take any questions.